practical uh, thing is that at the back of the side mandy there's a sign uh, book that if possible you could sign in as you come but don't worry about it now maybe before you go but it's just a COVID um, requirement please that we would just report people that are coming So Lord, we, we pray that you will meet with us by your Spirit. We pray that you will move in our hearts so that we can give you the honour and the praise and the worship that is due to you. And we ask, Lord, that as your word is preached, we pray that you will speak to us and that you will teach us and you will instruct us and you will challenge us and rebuke us and correct us, Lord, that we might be conformed to your image and that Lord, our lives might uh, give honour and praise to you. So be with us now, Lord, as we come to worship in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63. Isaiah is a book full of uh, imagery and prophecy and lots of stuff that, to be honest, is difficult to understand. But the verses I want to read are quite easy to understand. And it's Isaiah 63, verse 7 and 8. And it's a, it's a prayer of Isaiah. Isaiah 63, verse 7 and 8. And it reads, I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord. The deeds for which he is to be praised. According to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for the house of Israel. According to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their savior. I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. And that word according is, appears twice. According to all the Lord has done for us. And it says according to his compassion and many kindnesses. And what does that word according mean? It's well, because God is like this, then I can expect him to do that. And um, we, we call these, these things attributes. And uh, this, these, uh, these verses are full of the, some of the attributes of God that we can think about. Isaiah says, I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord. That's one of the attributes of God, that he is a kind God. And the deeds for which he is to be praised. And what God... The things that God does enable us to praise Him, or our response to what God does is praise. And He does these things according to what He is like, according to His kindness. He 
does these things. And it, it says, yes, the many good things he has done for the house of Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. And in this, we see God is kind and God is good and compassionate. And these are things that enable us to praise him. And if you think of that Psalm 51 where David, that Psalm of repentance after David has sinned, and in verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 51, David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And David is appealing to God because God is compassionate and because of his unfailing love, David knows that he can ask God for forgiveness and that God can wash away his iniquity and cleanse him from his sin. And in Psalm 25, verse 7, David again says, Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. So as we come this morning, we can sing praise to God because we know that he is a kind God. He is a good God. He is a compassionate God. And because of who God is, we can praise him. And if you notice in verse 8, it says, Isaiah said that God said, Surely they are my people, sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their saviour. And the God, because of who God is and because of his love, God has become our saviour. John 3.16 for God so loved the world, or according as God so loved the world, therefore he sent his Son. Because of who God is, God has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. And this morning we're going to sing three songs. The first one is, I will sing the wondrous story. Just like Isaiah says here, I will tell of the kindness of the Lord. Well, we are going to sing of the wondrous story of Christ coming into the world. The next hymn we're going to sing, or the next song, is The Greatest Thing in All My Life. And as we think of these attributes of God, they, they are wonderful, and surely God is the best thing in our lives. And the song, The Greatest Thing in All My Life, says the greatest thing in all my life is knowing you, loving you, and serving you. And then our final song is Jesus, Strong and Kind. And that song says, Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. Jesus said that if I'm weak, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy. No one else can be my strength. I should come to him. And then it finishes and it says, for the Lord is good, or according to as the Lord is good. Because the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. So let's stand and sing these songs together. And the first one is, I will sing the wondrous story.
So many of you will be aware that Wednesday, two weeks ago, or last week I guess, um, we decided as a church to call Kevin O'Connor to take up the role of pastor in our church. Now, Kevin is currently studying in the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kentucky. He'll be back here uh, full time January 12 months. So we're very excited about this decision that's been made. And Kevin, to express his gratitude, which many of you will have seen this already, I decided to pen a letter just to formally accept the invitation and also to express his gratitude. So this is Kevin's letter. To my brothers and sisters at NBC, it is with an immense sense of gratitude to our gracious God and Father that I joyfully accept your invitation to take up the role of pastor beginning in January 2023. Roxy and I were overjoyed when Dan called us on Wednesday evening with the result of the vote. I am simply delighted that I will get to serve as your pastor when we come back from the U.S. The words of David in Psalm 16 come to mind. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I am so grateful to God that the lines of his providence have fallen for me and my family in Middleton with you all. Ever since we moved to NBC in 2018, Roxy and I have been greatly blessed to get to know you all. We were reminded of this great blessing this summer when we were back in Middleton for my candidacy process. I really appreciated how welcoming and open you all were throughout those weeks. 
It was wonderful to get to know you all a bit more, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you all a lot more once we are back in Ireland. I also want to take the opportunity to thank the elders, Dan, Seth, Peter and Colin, for all their help over the entire candidacy process. I am excited to join them on the team of elders and to serve alongside them. I realise there are still 16 months to go until we are back in Ireland. Part of me wants to move back tomorrow, which was actually last week, so that I can get to work right away. But the training and development that I'm getting here in the US is of immense value to me as I prepare for pastoral ministry. That being said, I appreciate your patience. Please be assured of my prayers for you until we move back home. I do hope it will be possible for me to see you all before then, Lord willing. Finally, I want to say from the outset that my confidence and sufficiency for ministry is found in the Lord himself and not in myself or any giftings or training that I may have. I say this in line with the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. My goal is to minister among you with the sufficiency that comes from God by His Spirit, with full confidence in Him, and not in myself. There are many more things that I could say at this time, but for now I just want to give thanks to the Lord for what He has done, know, excuse me, how He has led us all in this process. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. Psalm 145, verse 3. I will leave you with the wonderful words of benediction that we find in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 to 21, which reads, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us which is pleasing, that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Your brother in Christ, Kevin. We're delighted to welcome Kevin aboard the eldership team and as our full-time pastor. I think many of us who didn't know him so well got to know him very well during his time here. And I think we'd all agree that the heart that he has for ministry comes out in his letter of gratitude as well. So I do continue to pray for Kevin and for Roxy and for Bella and for Sufyan. And if you don't know what to pray for them, just remember to pray what you pray for yourself. Thank you. Pray for Kevin, as a matter of fact. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of gathering in your name. We thank you that you have been faithful to your church here in Middleton over the years, that you have grown your church, that you have seen people come to faith, you have people, you've seen people being released from the powers of sin and death. And we thank you that you continue to be faithful to us in presenting to us a man who can take up our role of full-time pastor. We pray for Kevin. We thank you for him. We thank you for the opportunities that you've opened up for him. We pray that as he continues his study in Kentucky, that you would give him strength and perseverance and focus, and you would help him get the most out of this experience which so few people get to enjoy. Equip him, Father, train him up, raise him up, and be building him up, so that he continues to rest not in his ability or his skill, but in your power and in your sovereignty. We pray for Roxy as she continues to be a faithful wife and mother. We pray that she would be granted peace on the days where Kevin is busy and she is often managing the household while he's studying or he's working. We pray for Bella and Sufyan. We pray that even now you'll be speaking to them and instilling in them the seed of your gospel. 
and raising them up to be believers in Jesus Christ. Pray for us as well, Lord, as we continue to manage this process over the next 16 months. We pray that you would continue to be faithful to us as you have been, and that you would continue to fulfill your promise that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We pray all these things, not for our glory, but for yours, in accordance with your will, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Uh, just two other announcements to, to make as well. Um, for the young people, the, um, there is a, a, a youth club on this um, Friday, 7 to 9, my place, the place that we used to go to, my place, um, this Friday at 7. And also, the Munster um, Bible College has an online course in New Testament the week of the 4th to the 6th of October. Um, it's the second in a series, and if you want information, see Seth, whatever Seth is, but Seth is there. So if you're interested in the online New Testament course, see Seth, 4th to the 6th of October. Okay, so just before Seth comes up to, to bring God's word and before the children go out, I shall just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many good things that you have done for us. And we thank you, Lord, that they are according to your compassion and your many kindnesses and your goodness and your greatness. We thank you, Lord, that Kevin and Roxy are going to be coming to join us in, in, a couple, in the year after next, Lord, and we do continue to pray that you'll bless them. Lord, we pray for all in our church who are going through difficulties, difficulties relating to health, difficulties in, in the mind, difficulties with temptation, difficulties in relation to work or home situations, Lord. We pray that you will sustain and watch over your people here in Liberton. We pray, Lord, that this church will continue to be a good witness in our town and that you will add to the number, Lord, that you have brought into this church and that you will be reaching out and working in people's lives in our community. We pray for Carrick Tool, the outreach there, Lord. We pray for Seth and Jessica as they oversee that work and we pray Lord that you will give them wisdom as to how to reach out and Lord bless all that has taken place up to now and we pray that you will continue to bring fruit in the months and years to come. We pray Lord for the home groups that meet. We pray that as we meet together Lord you will encourage us as your body and that we will learn and grow together and support each other in the Christian walk. We pray now, Lord, for the Sunday club as they go out. We pray for the teachers, that you will bless them as they teach your word to the children. Lord, please speak to our young people and open their eyes, Lord, open their hearts to know what a good and a great God you are. And we do pray, Lord, for the youth meeting on, on Friday. We pray for the young people as they meet, that you will encourage them and Teach them, Lord, and give them a real desire to follow you. And we ask you now, Lord, as Seth comes to bring your word, that you will speak through him, and that, Lord, we will hear not what Seth has to say, Lord, but what you have to say to us this morning. So we commit this time to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. chapter 10, that's where we are in our series, Luke chapter 10. I wonder if you've ever had a time when you felt really just powerful, a time when people are really just listen to what you had to say, the room goes quiet and, and people want to know 
what you have to say, or they follow your advice or listen to your orders. Um, a time when you maybe felt really knowledgeable. Maybe a time when, when you knew the right answer and everybody respected you for that. It feels good, doesn't it? Of course it does. The way the world is set up today though, some people get times like that, get that good feeling a lot more than other people. Some people are always respected for the power that they have, um, for the knowledge that they have, for the privilege that they have over others, while other people are generally kind of ignored. And people value those things, that power and knowledge and privilege, they value those things so much. And most of us, I mean, we want to be in that group that is respected, not the group that is ignored. But our passage today teaches us that this entire system of valuing power and knowledge and privilege above everything, like the world around us does, is actually missing the main point of what's really important. There is something better than any of these things, and it's something that any of us can have. But before, I, before we talk about what that is, I want us to remember where we are in the book of Luke. So last week, Dan took us uh, through the beginning of chapter 10, and he showed us how Jesus sends out 72 of his disciples in groups of two to announce in every town the kingdom of God has arrived. He sends them out, Dan was showing us, with compassion and with clarity. So compassion because they're being invited to come into the kingdom of God. The message was for their salvation, for their forgiveness, for their life that would last forever. But there's clarity there as well. Because if they would not take the life that God was offering, the way that God was giving it to them, then they would have to pay for their sins themselves. Because there is no other path to forgiveness and life except the one that God has provided us in Jesus. Jesus said, he is the only way to the Father. There are not many ways to God, there is only one, but the invitation that God gives is for everyone to come the same way. So Jesus sends out these 72 to announce his kingdom, to invite people in uh, with his compassion and with clarity. He also gives them his own power to do miracles like he had been doing. So that everyone would know up front, without any question, for sure, this message really was from God himself. This was, this was God's kingdom coming. The sick are healed, the demons are driven out, but the point of all those powerful miracles that they're doing is to point back to the message that Jesus had given them, that the kingdom of God has come near you, as you see in verse 9. But as we look at today's passage in verses 17 to 23, we'll see that God's kingdom that he was calling people into is not like the kingdoms that we're used to. We're used to kingdoms in this world that focus on power and knowledge and privilege. These are the things that the kingdoms of the world seek after and fight for and value above everything. But Jesus makes it clear that the greatest reality possible is not to be more powerful, is not to know more, or to live above everybody else. The greatest reality possible is to be close to God himself. Everything else is secondary. Everything else that is good flows out of that one connection to him. So let's read our passage and then we'll, we'll dig into it. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 23, says this. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy, 
through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So what we see here, in these verses, Jesus acknowledges that God's power has been at work, but he redirects his disciples' attention to something that is greater, more wonderful than the great power that is at work. He says, your names are written in heaven. You have a connection to God forever, and that's better than any amount of power. But then he also talks about the wise and the learned in the world, the people the world respects for all that they know. And Jesus says there is something more wonderful than that knowledge. It is God's revelation of himself to his people. There's nothing on earth that could be, um, there's nothing on earth you could ever know that is greater than knowing God himself. Finally, he talks about the prophets and kings who would have loved to see what the disciples are seeing. They have the highest privileges on earth of kingdoms and messages from God, and yet God says that what these ordinary disciples have is an even greater privilege. We are seeing and even participating in the establishment of God's kingdom. They're seeing his promises come true, and that's better than any privilege, any other privilege the world can offer. So power and knowledge and privilege are all redirected here, all put in their place, and it's clear that being close to God is greater than any of these things. But let's take a look at each one quickly, power and knowledge and privilege, and why being close to God really is better than anything. First we'll look at power. These 72 disciples, they went out to preach the good news, and God gave them power and authority, and they were delighted. They had seen God's power working through them in amazing ways. They had healed people, they had cast out demons in the name of Jesus. That would be really thrilling, really exciting to see. They'd never experienced anything like it. They come back with joy, and you can understand that. They say, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. We have power over the spiritual forces of evil. They listen to us. They obey us when we speak to them with your authority. I mean, of course they're happy. Who wouldn't be? But Jesus responds to them, and he says, yes, Satan is defeated. He has been cast out of heaven. I saw it happen. He fell like lightning from heaven. His days are numbered. There is no enemy that can stand against God. It's not a fair fight. It's not like Satan and God are equally matched opponents and we don't know for sure who's going to win. It's not like that at all. Jesus' authority as God himself is complete. When Jesus says, I have given you authority to his disciples to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you, he can keep a promise like that because he is the absolute power of the universe. Nothing challenges that. Jesus' disciples got a taste of that, of the victory that Jesus has, um, as Jesus enabled them to do miracles and to see his power and authority at work through them. So they're rejoicing in this spiritual power that Jesus had given them and in the victories that they're seeing. But Jesus says there is something better something greater to be happy about. He says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He's saying that the power is not actually the point. The greatest gift that Jesus gave them is not power over the enemy. The greatest gift that Jesus gave them was to be brought close, to be friends with God himself. That friendship does come with power, yes, 
But the greatest thing here is not the power. The greatest thing is to be close to God. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. If you, this morning, are putting your trust in Jesus, then God has your name written in his, in his book of life. He has put you down in a, with an RSVP for heaven itself, for paradise. And let me tell you, heaven is not heaven, and it's not so joyful and amazing just because the weather is nice, or just because there are mansions and feasts and things like that. Heaven is heaven because we will live in unbroken fellowship and in friendship and closeness and with our Creator Himself. See, down here on earth, our closeness to God is often broken and, and shadowed by sin. And the, by the consequences of sin that are all around us, our own sin, the sin of others, all the broken realities that we see in this fallen world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, now we only see as a, in a reflection in a mirror. But then, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The fullness of God is the fullness of life itself, the real thing, the source of everything good. And that is why heaven is heaven. It is not just a place where everything is good. It is a place where we come face to face with good itself because we come face to face with God. So having a place reserved for us in heaven, having that connection to God is greater by far than any amount of power that you could experience on earth. It's greater than being the emperor of the entire world. It's greater than being able to do any amount of miracles. For God himself to recognize your name to bring you in as a citizen of his kingdom, to adopt you as one of his own children, there is nothing greater that you can rejoice in this morning. The lowest of God's children in his kingdom has a higher position for all of eternity than the most powerful people on earth. And Jesus says, rejoice in that. And we can rejoice in that no matter what else is going on. Think about it. I mean, if we are seeing our enemies retreat and God's kingdom advance like these disciples were seeing at this time, we can rejoice even more that we have this connection to God. We have this relationship with God and this eternal place in his family. But also, when it looks like things are going backwards, when it looks like evil is winning and circumstances seem out of control, we can still rejoice. These 72 disciples almost certainly faced persecution for their faith later in their lives, as many Christians do today. And in those moments, they probably didn't feel so powerful as they did right now. But they could still rejoice in God and in His power and in His victory over sin and death through Jesus, and in their place that he has secured for them in heaven. And we can rejoice too. Even if we are wounded by the weapons of the enemy, we will not be defeated by them. We cannot be eternally harmed by them because God's victory is complete and it is secure. And we can rejoice. He will overcome all evil, just as he promised. He will do that forever. He has promised to work all things, including hard things, together for good for his children. And he will do that. His power is complete. And if our names are written in heaven, then we will be in heaven too. Nothing can change that. Everything else is temporary. So no matter what we face, no matter how powerful we feel right now, or how powerless we feel right now, we can rejoice in God's salvation. As Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Jesus says, your names are written in heaven. So being close to God and part of his kingdom is better than any level of power we can have on earth. But it's also better than any level of knowledge that we could have. Look in verse 21. 
At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. The wise and learned of earth have always been respected. They're the experts that we hear on TV. They're the educators, the philosophers who shape the culture, or the scientists who tell us how things work. The world has always looked up to knowledge, just like it's always respected power. But Jesus tells us that there is something better than either of these things. He's not saying that knowledge is bad. He's not saying that it's bad to learn. God gave us our minds. He's glorified when we use them well. But what Jesus is saying here is that all knowledge in the world, if you have all the knowledge in the world, that cannot compare with this one thing. That is to know God himself. Because God is the center of reality. We were made for him. And if we ignore or reject him, then anything else we know will be missing the most important piece. Really missing the whole point. It will go off course. I mean, think about this. If, but we, we know a lot today about how people work. For example, we, we know how people work physically, mentally, a lot of, we have a lot of research and, and knowledge in these things. But if we ignore or reject God, then all that knowledge misses the actual point. It goes off, off course because the most important thing to know about people is that we are made for God. We are made in his image and we are made to have a relationship with him. So the wise and learned philosophers and psychologists and all the rest, the experts, they'll draw on lots of data to tell us about ourselves and tell us what we need to do to solve our problems. But if they leave God out, then their solutions will never fully work because they will be ignoring the fundamental problem of our separation from God because of our sin. Unless our relationship with God is restored, the consequences of sin will continue to destroy us one way or another. So generation after generation goes on with the same kinds of problems repeating themselves over and over again because, um, it, well, we're always trying, we're always trying new things, new cutting edge solutions, new ways to remodel society. We're always trying all these different things, but the problems stay. Because even with all that we have learned, we're still looking for the answers in the wrong places. The greatest knowledge of all is hidden, Jesus says, from the wise and learned of the world. Because the wise and learned people of the world have put their trust in their own knowledge instead of putting their trust in God who made us. And that's why we need to be careful. We need to be careful when we hear the wisdom of the world. There may be a lot of true things and actually genuinely helpful things in what the experts tell us. But if they are ignoring God, and not all of them do, but if they are, they're ignoring the foundation of knowledge itself. They're actually missing the point of knowledge itself because they're missing God. And that's a dangerous place to be. And we could be in danger as well if we blindly follow Someone who has knowledge, who is not founded on God. We've got to check that knowledge to make sure that it's, it is lining up with what God has revealed to us. And that takes work, especially when we have constant messages coming um, from all directions, TV and social media and, and conversations and all the rest. But it's worth the effort. We've got to stay close to the truth. Even if the people that the world holds up as wise and knowledgeable, even if they think that our commitment to God is foolishness, as Paul said that they would, he said the world sees, um, sees this as foolishness. But actually, the truth is that the most foolish thing that we could ever do is to ignore the God who made us and to ignore his salvation and to reject his love. So no matter how much we know about things, 
The most important knowledge of all will always be to know God personally. And Jesus says that this knowledge is a gift. Look in verse 22. No one, no, no one who, I say, no one knows who the Son is except the Father. No one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. God does not leave us to our own devices to discover Him. He takes the initiative and he reveals himself to us. And it's a good thing, because in our sin, we do not seek God naturally. We turn away from him, that's what sin is. But God reaches out, and he reveals himself, and he draws rebellious sinners like us into knowing him. And thankfully, he doesn't wait for us to reach a certain level of knowledge first. Jesus says he reveals himself to little children, he gives the greatest of all gifts, the greatest knowledge of all, not to the know-it-alls who already think they have everything sorted and they won't listen to anyone else because they already know, but to little children and to grown-ups who are like little children, who are humble and teachable and ready to trust. The greatest knowledge of all is not limited to those with the highest IQs or the highest credentials and university degrees. The greatest knowledge of all can be known by anyone Anywhere, when God reaches down and reveals himself to them and draws them in to knowing and trusting him. There is no greater thing to know than God himself. So we've seen now how the lowest people in God's kingdom have more to rejoice about than the most powerful people on earth. And the smallest child who truly knows God has a more wonderful knowledge than the most educated person on earth. And finally, let's consider what Jesus says about privilege. Look in verse 23. Then he turns to his disciples and said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. As these disciples follow Jesus, they are seeing, they are even participating in, the fulfillment of all God's promises throughout history. They're working with the promised Messiah to establish God's promised kingdom. These are things that Jesus says many prophets and kings had longed to see, but they hadn't. Powerful, privileged people in the Old Testament times looked ahead and they saw something greater ahead of them, something greater than their power and their privileged positions. They saw a better kingdom coming. They saw a better reality, a better hope. And from their high positions, they looked ahead and they saw that that is better than what we have now. Better than our kingdoms, better than our prophecies. That is the real thing. That's better than anything. And they were right. And yet here we are in our place in history. We have more than they had. Jesus has come. The kingdom is established on earth and it is growing despite the ongoing challenges. We have the privilege of being part of that even. Part of what God is doing on the earth. We have the privilege of seeing God at work. Our eyes are blessed as Jesus said his disciples were in verse 23. Not that we see Jesus in the same way they did. But we do see him working around us building his kingdom. We have the privilege of being part of his kingdom and of being able to participate in the work that he is doing on earth. And that privilege is greater than any other privilege the world can offer you. So let's just review where we've been today. The lowest people in God's kingdom have more to rejoice about than the most powerful people on earth. The smallest child who truly knows God has a more wonderful knowledge than the most educated people on earth. And the least noticed citizen of God's kingdom has a more privileged position than the kings and prophets of old or the most powerful people and most notable people in the world today. And how do we respond to these things? Jesus said, rejoice, rejoice. If you are in Christ this morning, then God has brought you near to himself 
And that fact alone is greater than all the power or knowledge or privilege that this world can offer you. But if you're not sure where you stand with God this morning, then don't rejoice in something that isn't true. I urge you to seek God, seek clarity in your, in your relationship with Him, listen to His invitation for salvation, and put your trust in Him. Then you will have something to rejoice about, as Jesus said. God says in Jeremiah 9, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man in his strength, nor the wealthy man in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. There is nothing greater, no power that you can claim can compare with a place in God's kingdom. No knowledge that you can attain can compare with knowing God himself. No privilege that you can reach can compare with the privilege of being God's child and serving in his kingdom. So today, you can let the joy of the Lord be your strength, as Ezra said. If you belong to Jesus, then these things are true and they cannot be shaken. That is better than any amount of power that you can have on earth. So when you feel powerful, or when you feel powerless, either way, you can bring it to God. You can, have, you can trust your connection to Him and find all the strength you need in Him and find all the hope you need in Him and in His promises. Your name is written in heaven. No matter what else is going on, that's more than enough cause to rejoice. But you can also rejoice in knowing right now here on earth, the greatest knowledge of all, which is to know God personally. Don't ignore that. Lean into it. Build everything about your life on that knowledge. Get to know God as well as you possibly can. Spend time with Him. Talk to Him. Bring Him your requests and your praise. Study His Word so that, as Paul said, you can comprehend the length and width and height and depth of the love of Christ and know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Paul's overriding goal in his life was to know Christ and to be found in Him. Make that your goal today and this week and every day. And you can know the privilege of seeing God at work in you and at work around you, and actually sharing in that work. As Paul said, he was sharing the boundless riches of Christ with others. This is a privilege greater than any king or prophet of old. God has given you a place, and he has given you a job in his kingdom. So instead of seeking privileges from the world around you, live out the privileged position that you already have as God's child and as an official ambassador of the eternal kingdom of heaven. You already have that. If you are in Christ today, you have power. You have knowledge. You have privilege that is greater than anything the world can offer you. You already have them. But don't rejoice in those things. Rejoice in the fact that God has brought you near to himself and has written your name in heaven forever. Amen. to just uh, sing this benediction of, of, from Romans 15 where Paul um, says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's just start, stand and we'll sing this together.
Lord, we pray that your hope will fill us, that, Lord, we will overflow with joy as we trust in you, Lord. Help us to lift up our eyes, to lift them above all that distracts us in this world, Lord, and to keep our focus on you. And we pray this 